Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. I um, want to welcome everybody to the Iowa Nutri Research Center Fall Seminar Series. Um, we are fortunate today to have Dr. Chris Jones from the University of Iowa, IIHR, Hydroscience and Engineering, uh, to talk about uh, Water Quality Index. Uh, just put a plug in that we have the previous um, sessions recorded and on the website, and we'll have future ones re recorded as well. And uh, next month we have Antonio Arenas, so uh, transplant from the University of Iowa that we've been able to get over here to Iowa State University. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Jones. Okay, thanks, Matt. Thanks for the invitation. And there you can see the Stanley Building where IIHR is located. And I am not sitting in there, um, even though, you know, technically I'm IIHR uh, staff and scientific staff. And so I'm over in Trowbridge Hall with the Rock Hounds at the Iowa Geological Survey. So Keith and I can conspire on how we're going to, you know, destroy Iowa. And so I'm over here and, uh, and I'm not in the Stanley building, but Stanley building is so much more dramatic than Trowbridge, Bridge. And so that's my first slide there. And so I have a website. I keep it pretty active, um, newly redesigned. Uh, and so I post all my slides uh, and I have not got these up there yet, but I will here in the next day or two. And so anybody that wants to go and get my slides, they can go get them. Um, I also <clears throat> write essays pretty regularly and, pu and put them there in the blog post page. And so if you're interested in that, you can go um, see that. And I recently just started doing a podcast with Sylvia Secchi here. And I think some of you have heard of her. And I'm posting links to those podcasts on the website too. So. Um, there it is. So a little bit about me. I, I am from Iowa. I grew up in Ankeny, just south of Ames there. I went to Simpson College in Indianola. I did my graduate work at Montana State. Um, I worked in Minnesota for quite a long time in, commercial, in a commercial testing lab and then doing consulting work. I worked at Des Moines Waterworks for eight years and Iowa Soybean Association for four before coming over here to Iowa City and have been here for six years. And so I've seen uh, these issues uh, surrounding water from a lot of perspectives. And, and so I think uh, that helps me do what I do. And so water quality, uh, that's what we're talking about today. How do we define it? And so it's, I think everybody knows, you know, it's not one thing, uh, what is water quality? Well, you know, it depends on the body of water that we're looking at, or are we talking about water that we drink or flowing streams or lakes or oceans or groundwater or what have you. And so uh, there's no one definition of water quality for, for anything. And so um, so how do we define it? And one way we've tried to define it is uh, with standards. And so we, uh, put quantitative or empirical values onto the, the water, the chemical, biological, and physical characteristics of the water. And, you know, if it meets those standards, then, you know, we call it good. And if it doesn't, we call it bad. But, you know, we have standards for all different things, the drinking water, the wastewater, and, and so forth. Uh, and, you know, we have the Clean Water Act here in the U.S. And, the overarching goal of the Clean Water Act was for all the waters of the U.S. to be swimmable and fishable. And so really, we can't even agree on what that is. And so lots of definitions, lots of standards um, for what water is good and what water is bad. Um, a lot of times we look at the species that are uh, present in these surface waters to determine, you know, whether they're, they're good or bad. And so, um, you know, here in the upper Mississippi River Basin, we always oftentimes look at the smallmouth bass as sort of an indicator species. 
Um, this is my friend, Kirk Manfredi, who's a chemistry professor at UNI. Uh, and we fish the upper Mississippi and good smallmouth bass fishing. And so, you know, that's an indicator that there's still some biotic integrity up there. But, you know, the smallmouth bass is a good indicator species because it's, it's kind of the Goldilocks species. It's not overly sensitive like the brook trout, where the brook trout's only going to survive in a, a few uh, bodies of water. And it's, it's not um, real super tolerant like the channel catfish, which can live about anywhere. And so that's not a good indicator, but uh, smallmouth bass is a good indicator. Uh, we also sometimes look at these uh, assemblages of species, and so we have quantitative ways of measuring that, the, the IBI index of biotic integrity and the, the benthic macro, the BM IBI, the benthic macro invertebrate, invertebrate in index of biotic integrity. And so we look at these uh, pollution intolerant species commonly. Um, like the hexagenia mayfly there that's sitting there on my big ugly head. Um, you know, these can be indicators too of, of uh, whether or not a body of water is of a high quality or not. But the problem with this biological, uh, these biological indicators is that monitoring is very expensive. And so in Iowa, we have 70,000 miles of streams. And so we might you know, look at um, metrics such as this, you know, maybe once in 20 years in a stream. And so it's not, you know, these aren't real good things to tell us uh, what the present condition is because it's really difficult to monitor for this stuff. And as such, um, the scientific community is commonly re relied on what we call this water quality index. And so, we try to take a aggregation of data, usually chemical, biological, and physical data, and throw it into some algorithm that gives us one a number that can tell us um, whether a, a water body is good, bad, or, or somewhere in between. And so this is not a new concept. It goes back you know, more than 100 years um, and just, you know, um, semantics uh, thing here. We have two types of water quality index where we, the high numbers are good, the low numbers are bad, and then a water pollution index, which is the opposite, basically the same thing. Uh, but even with the index, there's things that can, can confound uh, the process of making conclusions about, you know, whether what's good and what's not good. And one of the things that confounds things here in the upper Midwest is we really don't have any reference streams. And so all our streams are in some kind of disturbed condition, uh, some less than others, but most of the streams here in Iowa are what we would consider highly disturbed. And so what should uh, good water quality look like in Iowa? Um, we, you know, we have data uh, that goes back, you know, before 1900 even, but we really don't know what exactly, um, you know, good water quality would look like. The other thing here, we've had these hydrological changes. And so you can see that picture there, uh, Billy Beck presented over here a couple of years ago, uh, Walnut Creek in Jasper County. And so it's been straightened. And so, you know, what is, uh, you know, what should we expect for water quality from a stream like that? where there's been so much hydrological change and so much disturbance, you know, what should it be? What's good? It's, it's really subjective. And so, you know, other things of the same nature, the Missouri River. Uh, the Missouri River historically was a muddy stream. Uh, we've turned it into a clear stream through straightening and the dams and, and incision and so, uh, you can see there on the left, that's the Missouri River on the Iowa border there, in Western Iowa, where the old channel was and, and where the new channel is and how we construct these, uh, these structures here to maintain the, the stream channel. So, you know, what's good water quality in the Missouri River? Should it be muddy or should it be clear? Uh, the historical condition would have been muddy. 
And so again, a lot of this is pretty subjective. So the process of developing the water quality index uh, goes through these four steps where you identify the parameters. Uh, they're gonna go into your, your formula. Uh, you transfer the monitoring data from those parameters into one um, index value. Sometimes you weight some of the parameters and that's not always done, but it's commonly done, especially for dissolved oxygen because dissolved oxygen is really this, um, you know, a value where, you know, a low value, a bad value can kill the whole stream and, you know, one fell swoop over a, a matter of hours. And so some people like to give that a lot of weight. Uh, but whether you not the weight, whether or not you weight the parameters, then you aggregate uh, the index values to get a final index score. And so Iowa did have a water quality index for a number of years. Uh, it was created in 2005, I believe by Mary Skopek and others. Uh, and this was a modification of the water quality index that was created by the National Sanitation Foundation. And so you can see there in that table the, the values that the Iowa index used um, and what the, the National San Sanitation Foundation used, uh, very similar. But again, the Iowa had this index uh, beginning in 2005. Uh, the parameters were not weighed uh, in the Iowa index. And so that was a, different, a difference between the National Sanitation Foundation index. And we had ge uh, geographical differences here in how we calculated the index in Iowa. And so TDS was one of the parameters. Uh, we divided uh, the state into three sections for TDS. Uh, also for TSS, you can see there. And the, the Iowa index really uh, worked pretty well. It rated uh, the bad waters worse and the good waters better than, that, than the National Sanitation Foundation um, calculation, uh, which was good because it provided some spread uh, for all our streams. Um, and so here is the old index. Um, and when historical data was was plunked into it and you can see that it, it did not rate our streams as good or excellent very often. Um, some years, uh, you can see two, 2007, you know, very few of our streams were, were rated as good or excellent. The vast majority were rated as fair or below. Um, we had some real bad years there from 2007 up to about 2011. It tended to rate streams higher during dry years, probably not surprisingly, like 2000 and 2012. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the whole thing crashed in 2014. Um, and that was because of the way that the index was constructed. And so if there was monitoring data that was missing, that parameter was assigned a sub-index score of 50. Well, in 2014, DNR had budget problems. They had to stop uh, monitoring for pesticides. And because uh, if the monitoring data point was missing, the sub-index score of 50 was given. Well, if everything else scored 100 and pesticides scored a 50, then the maximum uh, index value you could achieve for a stream was 87. And so that made an excellent rating impossible for all Iowa streams. And to top it off, historically, pesticide data was not driving the index value. Uh, we <clears throat> historically had, had not measured uh, many pesticides in our, our streams at the, you know, during the history of this uh, monitoring for the index. And so we automatically just lowered the index value for all our streams, even though pesticides weren't driving the, the index value. And so the whole thing just kind of went kapoof, as, as that gal was saying there. And, but a lot of people hated the index. 
uh, because it raided so many of our streams badly. And so they were happy to see this thing go. Uh, but then in 2016, Roger Bruner with the DNR came to me and, and asked, well, would I be interested in helping DNR develop a new index? And, and I said, sure. And so working with Rick Langle, Rick Langle here at the Geological Survey, um, we did that. We uh, created a new index for water quality index for DNR. And so the three components of our work there, we, we compared the parameters used for the old index with those of other indices that were used around North America. Um, we used, uh, used and aggregated the water quality data from DNR's um, mono, ambient water monitoring program. And then um, we endeavored to develop alternatives to the old index that would be acceptable to all the stakeholders here in Iowa. And so the tasks here, I did liter literature search and review on all the existing indices that were out there. Rick, Rick who's really a, a data guru, he kind of aggregated all the data. Then we took all that ag aggregated data and we had applied it to the other existing indices that were out there. Uh, and through that process, we developed alternative an alternative to the the old Iowa WQI, and then we, we wrote a report and submitted it to DNR. And so what we did, we selected 12 watersheds um, at that time. Again, this is five years ago, um, that would be representative of the state. So we had six from the south, six from the north, six in the east, six in the west, uh, six large and six small. And so those were the, the watersheds that Rick uh, aggregated data for. Uh, we threw them into the old Iowa WQI just to see what things would look like. And, and you can see these um, percent exceeding graphs. Um, about 80% of the time, you know, those 12 watersheds were rating, were measuring good or below. Uh, about half the time they were measuring fair or below. We really didn't see much difference uh, between large and small streams. Uh, we did get some separation here between uh, the east and west and the north and south. The west streams tend to be bad more often than the east streams. Likewise, the north streams tend to be good more often than the, than the south streams, although at the high end, there's not much difference. So this is using the old Iowa water quality index for the 12 streams we selected. So then we took the aggregated data and we started throwing it into other indices. And the first was the Oregon uh, water quality ind indices or index. And you can see there the parameters they look at are ammonia, nitrate, total phosphorus, total solids, fecal, temperature, DO, BOD, and pH. And the Oregon WQI measured our, our streams as very poor almost all the time. Um, we didn't get much separation uh, between streams. Uh, and so we really didn't think this one was gonna fly. Uh, the Washington WQI uh, actually was my second choice at the time. Uh, you can see how the, they have these narrative descriptors, a low concern, moderate concern, and high concern. And so you can see our 12 streams where they, where they fell here. Um, you know, about 70% of the time, our streams would be of moderate concern or worse. Uh, we did get some separation here uh, geographically, again, between east and west and north and south as well as large and small. And so the Washington WQI measured our small streams, uh, you know, better for the most part uh, than the large streams. Then we, we tried the old National Sanitation Foundation uh, WQI, uh, very commonly used all over the world. And this is really 
<clears throat> geared toward um, point source dominated systems. And so you can see here, this one actually rated our streams fairly, um, fairly well. Um, you know, our streams were good or better about half the time. You can see the, the parameters there that are used to calculate that index. Um, we looked at what was called the water quality index of, of Saeed et, et al. there. It's a husband and wife uh, research team. They did a lot of their work in Florida, I believe. Um, this particular indice index was highly weighted uh, towards DO. And so uh, DO was extremely important. Um, we had, you know, we typically have high DO in all of our streams. And so as a result, it rated the vast majority of our streams as good. Finally, we, we looked at the Alberta uh, Water Quality Index, and this is the one we selected. Um, Alberta, the province of Alberta looks at 47 monitored parameters. Um, we did not have data for all those 47, but I think we had data for more than half of them. And so we threw that in, we threw our data into the, the Alberta equation and you can see how our stream shook out. Um, we ended up selecting the Alberta uh, index for a couple of reasons. One, um, it accommodates any number of parameters. And so if you have 100 parameters or you have two parameters, you can still calculate an index. The other thing that was really attractive about the Alberta index was if, if you, um, missed a sample or, you know, you couldn't monitor for something because of, of budget reasons or, you know, somebody was sick that day. It didn't throw the thing uh, out of kilter. You could still use uh, the data and still maintain some consistency uh, from year to year. And so the Alberta WQI is what we call a performance indicator. And by that, we mean it's calculated based on a fraction of the samples that meet designated thresholds. And so you pick your parameters, you set your thresholds, and the index is calculated on how often your stream or your lake exceeds that threshold for the selected parameters. Another factor that goes into the calculation is the magnitude of uh, the exceedances. And so we really thought this particular one would be easy to understand by the public and the policymakers. Uh, it allowed us to focus on the stressors most important to, to water quality in Iowa. And so we could pick our own parameters using the Alberta equation. Uh, the monitoring, you know, we really felt that whatever we selected uh, the monitoring needed to be of moderate cost. Um, we needed flexibility to endure these changes in budget that sort of crashed the previous WQI. And then, you know, we had a lot of flexibility with this, it, this whole process here with the Alberta uh, index allowed DNR staff and their scientists to incorporate ideas and we could uh, have the flexibility to change um, with changing public perceptions and expectations of our water. And so um, after deciding on this particular index, we had to decide what parameters are driving water quality in Iowa streams and can they be easily and inexpensively monitored. And so what we ended up picking in consultation with DNR was dissolved oxygen a total nitrogen, which is a combination of the inorganic and organic forms, total phosphorus, E. coli, and turbidity. So these were the five parameters that we selected to, um, to throw data into the, the equation there to determine the water quality index for Iowa. And so there's the equation there. I won't spend a lot of time on this, but you can see there F1, number of water quality, 
variables that do not meet the objectives in at least one sample during the time period under consideration. Uh, and I won't read through the rest of them. If you're interested, you can get the slides. And so the really important step here was the selection of the thresholds. So what you know is good and what is bad in Iowa uh, for the five parameters. And so what I did is I designed four scenarios and they're not dramatically different. Uh, for E. coli, we selected 235 colonies per 100 mils for the simple reason is that's the number in Iowa code for class A streams. Um, that also was consistent with EPA guidance on what was suitable for recreation. Um, and so that was selected for all four scenarios. A uh, total nitrogen, uh, 3.5 in all four. Turbidity, you can see there, we selected 50 and 25. Dissolved oxygen, uh, five, and then we looked at both total phosphorus and orthophosphorus, uh, 0.18 for total and 0.1 for ortho. We selected five for, we wanted these thresholds to be defendable or defensible. And so we selected five for dissolved oxygen because the border states, Illinois and Minnesota, both use a, a standard of five. Uh, the turbidity is of 25 is what uh, Minnesota uses for their stream standard for all their uh, streams except for trout streams. Um, but we did also consider 50, as I said, uh, especially because these Missouri River tributaries um, may have been turbid. Uh, um, you know, there's a higher level of turbidity could be expected for these Missouri tributaries. And so the two big ones that we thought would be controversial would be nitrogen and phosphorus. And so we picked 0 0.18 for total phosphorus because uh, that would be consistent with a 45% reduction that we have as an objective in the nutrient strategy. And so 0 0.18 re would represent a 45% reduction in the average stream phosphorus here in Iowa. And, uh, determined in this in the literature there in this paper that Keith was on um, in 2013. Hmm. Also 0.18 is very similar to the standard um, that's used uh, by Minnesota in their southern region streams which could be expected to be similar uh, to Iowa here. Then for nitrogen we picked 3.5 because once again that was about uh, a 45 percent reduction from what uh, was determined to be the mean uh, concentration in Iowa streams. Again, a paper that Keith was a co-author on there. And so these uh, thresholds, um, we really kind of felt like it was important to let the nutrient strategy be the guide on what uh, these thresholds would be for nitrogen and phosphorus. Now, I will say, uh, to go back to E. coli here, EPA has recently um, issued some new guidance on E. coli, and this just came out in the last oh, few months. And you can see there, um, they're kind of embracing this statistical threshold value where 90% of the samples should be less than a certain uh, level there, <clears throat> 410 colonies per 100 mils. And so uh, we did not use this new guidance Excuse me, I didn't have it available at the time we did this work. So, here's these <clears throat> percent exceedance curves for the 12 Iowa streams <clears throat> that we used. Uh, and you can see there how our WQI worked. And so, under the different scenarios. Not a lot of spread there in the scenarios. Um, our streams are not, we're not rating good uh, or excellent very often. And so I should say these narrative description, descriptors of excellent, Alberta set that at 96, good at 81, 
fair at 61, marginal 46, and then poor at 10, we would have the, or DNR would have the option of setting those wherever they wanted. And so if we wanted to say good was 50, we could. Uh, but when I created the, re the report for DNR, I used the, the Alberta uh, narrative descriptors there. And so again, you can see about 70% of the time our streams were, were rating below marginal, at least according to the Alberta uh, descriptors. But again, to emphasize, DNR would have uh, the option to set those wherever they want. How the different streams shook out, um, you can see there, um, Overall, in the upper left, uh, the large versus small in the upper right. The lower left, the east versus west, and the, the uh, or lower left, east, east versus west, and lower right, north versus south. And so this was scenario two, which is the, the one I um, selected for this. Um, I didn't want to go through all of these all the scenarios here because I have more material to present. But you can see here the east streams rating better than the west streams, the north streams uh, rating better than the south streams. And so we wrote this up, presented it to DNR five years ago, and they still have not implemented it. Um, I think, you know, one of the reasons why is there's really a an opposition uh, to using any sort of number like this uh, from people out there in the public. We, uh, you know, we don't really like standards or, or indices on our streams. And so DNR has just kind of sat on this and five years went by. And so I decided I'd kind of dig this up and start talking about it again and, and write it up in a paper. And so what I did was uh, for this recent work that I've done over the past few months is um, look at a broader spectrum of streams here in Iowa uh, for the period 20, uh, 2000 to 2020. Um, and you can see all the ones I've looked at there. Um, I think there's 44 sites here. Um, and you can see the streams in Northeast Iowa tend to rate quite a bit higher uh, than streams in Western Iowa. Um, Bloody Run Creek there in Northeast Iowa, which has been in the news over the last 20 years, it's our best stream. Uh, it produced an index value of 56.8. Uh, the Boyer River over the last 20 years, it's our worst it produces a, an index value of 26.0. <clears throat> when I look at the last five years, um, our best stream is the Upper Wapsie, uh, measured at Independence, Iowa, at 51.6. Our, our worst stream is uh, the Floyd River, uh, Northwest Iowa. It produces an index value of 21.4. This table, uh, a lot here I realize, but it, uh, the blue indi indicates improvement, the red indicates a degradation, and it looks at the last five years versus the period from 2000 to 2016. And so when we look at the last five years uh, compared to the entire historical record for these streams, we have three out of 44 that are getting better and for the WQI. And that by getting better, I meant that they've improved by more than 5% over the last five years. Uh, 16 out of 44, I said where there was no change, less than 5% change either way. And 25 out of the 44 are declining. I divided these up. Uh, <clears throat> sort of arbitrarily, but <clears throat> I put them in bins of the Iowan surface, the Paleozoic Plateau, uh, the Des Moines River Basin upstream from Des Moines, the Des Moines River Basin downstream from Des Moines, 
Missouri River tributaries, and then the Iowa skunk basins. And you can see there uh, at the bottom, only one of those bins is improving, uh, and that's the Des Moines River Basin downstream from Des Moines. Our best streams up in Northeast Iowa in the, in the Paleozoic Plateau, they are degrading the fastest along with our worst streams, uh, which are the Missouri River tributaries. Uh, as far as the five different parameters, you can see, you know, E. coli is actually improving at a lot of, a lot of sites. Um, you can see there nitrogen, it's a mix. Um, uh, phosphorus is a mix. And turbidity seems to be um, declining or getting worse at, at quite a few sites, which is a little bit of a surprise. So there's that. So kind of to sum up that table, um, over the last five years, our best stream there is the Wapsie, the Upper Wapsie, uh, the worst, the Floyd. Uh, the biggest improvement is the North River at Norwalk. And so that's kind of interesting. That's a, a watershed where it's undergoing a lot of urbanization on the Southwest side at Des Moines there. Um, you can see uh, Bloody Run Creek is kind of interesting. It's the best stream for total phosphorus over the last five years, but it's also had the biggest deterioration for phosphorus. Um, you can see here these streams in Northwest Iowa, the Rock and the Floyd are really in poor condition um, as measured by our index. So there's Bloody Run in Northeast Iowa. There's the rock and the Floyd in far northwest Iowa. So I had uh, 21 years of data there. I like to divide these up into you know different or into chunks. And so I have three seven-year chunks. You can see the statewide average. The first seven years, 38.1. The middle seven years, 40.8. The last seven years have been the worst at 37.5. Um, two streams on a continuous decline there, Old Man's Creek here near Iowa City, and then the West Nottoway in, in Southwest Iowa, and one stream on a, a continuous improvement. And that, again, that's a North River down in Norwalk. Uh, there's a North River. Um, Five-year running annual average in the WQI. Uh, the dotted line there. Uh, but I wanted to sort of emphasize how these streams in Northeast Iowa, which are our best streams, seem to be the ones that uh, you know, are really declining, uh, which is really unfortunate. So this is uh, the upper Iowa, Dorchester, uh, the Turkey River at Garber, Volga River there at Elkport, and then the Yellow River at Ion, Iowa, and then Bloody Run Creek. And all these streams in Northeast Iowa seem to be declining here over the last five years. Uh, the Boyer River, I put this on here. Uh, <laughs> over the last 20 years, it's probably our worst stream. It had the worst individual year of any stream, produced a WQI of 10 back in 2007. There was one day in 2007, the Boyer had a, a DO of 4.7, an E. coli of 220,000, <coughs> excuse me, total nitrogen of about 10, a total phosphorus of five, which is that's big, and turbidity of 2,600, and that day it had a Kel ball, 7.7. That was probably the worst day in Iowa water quality history right there. So there's a Boyer. And so one thing about the Boyer, and I don't know if any of you guys have seen this website, you know, it's a lot of our, it's characteristic of a lot of our streams in, in Western Iowa. And are you seeing this uh, here? I 
Matt, are you there? Yep, I'm, I'm, I'm here. Are you seeing this map of North America? No, no, no. We did, we see your PowerPoint. Well, I was going to show this. Uh, this river runner website and it, it gives you like a Google Earth view of the entire stretch of river. And I don't know, I don't think I'm going to try it, but it shows how the boyer has been straightened. And so the boyer is about 100 miles long and it's essentially been straightened through its entire course. And so a lot of these Western Iowa streams have been straightened. And so they, you know, there's no uh, meanders left in them. And so I think this really contributes to the poor water quality that we measure out there. Uh, there's none of the, uh, no hydrological integrity left in these streams. And so um, anyway, as I said, the last uh, year or so, I thought, well, DNR is not going to do anything with this. I'm going to write it up and submit it for a journal, journal article. These are the sites I looked at for the journal article, and I, I wanted a, uh, a real consistent uh, data record for all my sites. Um, and so they all start at the same year. Uh, and so these are the sites that I picked. Um, you can see where they're located in Iowa. And what I really wanted to do is to see what parameters were separating our, you know, our streams, what separates the good streams from the bad streams. And so I did these simple linear regressions um, of the parameters versus the WQI. And so this column is a percent exceedance. So how often is the threshold exceeded for the different parameters? This is the magnitude of the exceedance. And so it's the, the uh, exceedance threshold uh, ratio. And then I just looked at the average value here for the parameter, even though that does not go into the calculation. And so you can see that turbidity, um, how often we exceed the turbidity threshold is what is really driving, most driving the, the water quality index. And so the old uh, idea that sediment is the more, most important <coughs> uh, pollutant, I think is still valid. Um, you know, that's what separates the, the good from the bad here in Iowa is turbidity. Um, we talk about nitrogen all the time. Nitrogen really isn't a separator uh, from the, you know, for the good streams from the bad streams. And, you know, that's because nitrogen is high in all our streams. And so that's not to say that nitrogen is important, but it's not what is producing a good or a bad WQI. And so that's my last slide on the water quality index. And so people tell me all the time, I just complain about stuff and I don't offer any solutions. And so I feel obligated to close with this slide, which I do in all my presentations. And so I have my five things that what we can do to improve water quality. And so my first one here is we need to ban cropping in the two-year floodplain. We've got the two-year floodplain map by LIDAR for the whole state of Iowa. We have about 400,000 acres uh, there. Why are we cropping there? Uh, let's not do that. Let's ban fall tillage. Iowa State's been putting out um, guidance on fall tillage since the 80s, how it's a bad practice. Why do we still do that around Iowa? I think, you know, we all know you can drive from Des Moines to the Minnesota border a month from now, you're going to see a lot of tillage. Let's ban manure on snow and frozen ground. We have some rules here in Iowa, but they're pretty easy to get around if there's a severe winter and we have snow on the ground March 1st, you're going to see manure on that snow on March 2nd. 
And so can we not do that anymore? <clears throat> Make farmers adhere to the ISU fertilization guidelines. And so I, you know, I know the um, Agribusiness Association is collecting and aggregating fertilization data. You know, we know, especially in high density livestock watersheds that we're, we're way, way above the uh, MRTN on N rates. Um, I would just say that, <clears throat> I say in all my presentations, uh, these edge of field practices are great, um, but how do we continue to ask the taxpayer to pay for those things when we give farmers a license to do whatever they want with inputs? I just, to me, that is not sustainable policy. Lastly, I think we need to reformulate the CAFO regulations. We all know that the manure management plans use the old yield goal formula. The counties have no authority to cite them or restrict citing. We need to revisit that. And so people say, well, any of this stuff make a difference? And I, I say, well, I don't know. <clears throat> it's intuitive. Uh, and I'd say it's low hanging fruit. And so, you know, how can we do the big stuff, which is get cover crops on half our acres um, <coughs> when we can't do the small stuff? <coughs> so, excuse me for the frog in my throat. That's my last slide. I'm happy to take any questions. Okay. Again, sorry about that phlegm in my throat. No worries. We're having an audio problem in our room. So if somebody has a question, feel free to uh, type it in or unmute yourself. So here's a question. Uh, if you don't, if you don't expect the DNR to adopt the index at least until the political climate changes, have you heard of other organizations that will or have? Do you have a plan to present the index logic to other organizations? Well, I submitted a paper to the journal Ambio. Um, it is being reviewed, um, and I titled the paper you know, proposed water quality index for corn belt streams or for agricultural watersheds, I think, something like that. And so if the paper's accepted, yes, I probably will start promoting it in some way. I heard DNR just hired two new statisticians to start going through this water quality data again. So I don't know what they're going to do. Uh, now that the index is five years old, are there things about it you would change to make it tell a more complete story? Well, <clears throat> um, I guess the thing that really needs to be looked at is the E. coli approach, since EPA has changed their guidance. <clears throat> There's a lot of disagreement on about E. coli in Iowa. Is it even a good indicator at all? Um, and I think there's uh, merit to that idea that maybe it isn't a good indicator. And so I'd be happy to look at any other biological uh, indicator, that, you know, a pathogen type indicator, uh, but nobody can agree what that is. Is it enterococcus? Is it some viruses? You know, what is it? Um, so I think that's one of the, the benefits of this Alberta index is, you know, we can change any time and you know, change from E. coli to Enterococcus or what have you. Here's a question. There may not be a conservation practice more often or aggressively promoted than cover crops. Is it your view that it's wholly unrealistic to expect cover crops to make a meaningful impact on any of the five indicators in your index? Well, I think it would affect turbidity for sure. Um, you know, if we had cover crops, 
on half our acres, I got to believe that's going to reduce uh, some erosion. Uh, and, you know, we know from the science assessment for the nutrient strategy that we had quantifiable reductions in, in nitrogen and phosphorus. And so, you know, I do think cover crops would help. Now, can we ever get to 45% of the acres or whatever it was uh, that was the objective? I, you know, that's the question, but. Um, I know uh, somebody's gonna type in another question, but I had one, Chris. Um, first off, thanks for the presentation. On those concentrations, are those mean annual concentrations low weighted? So they're, they're grab samples collected monthly by DNR. Um, and uh, so there's 12 uh, sample events in most years. I uh, calculate a, a WQI for each of the events and then an average WQI is calculated for the year. So that's how we did it. One, one last one I had. I was struck by the difference between Washington and Oregon since they're kind of so close yeah. together. Any thoughts why they give such a different answer? Yeah, um, you know, I think Washington is more of a, more of an agricultural state than Oregon in terms of crops. Uh, and so, you know, the eastern half of Washington is pretty intensely farmed. Uh, the eastern half of Oregon, I think, is mostly desert. Uh, and so, you know, that's, you know, my first instinct there, but Chelsea, are you typing one in? Okay, she's, she said she's almost done, so there we go. I realize that no one really cares about water quality of ditches when we can't maintain water quality of our rivers, but your statement about stream straightening degrading rivers made me wonder if those rivers are ditch-like and if drainage ditches might, be, might particularly contribute to water quality problems. Well, um, so the problem we have is our, our rivers have been turned into ditches. Um, and so like the Boyer uh, in Western, it's not just Western Iowa. I mean, Western Iowa is the worst for that, but we see it over here too. The English River is, has been basically ditched. And so <clears throat> um, these straight streams, um, they they flow a lot faster, right? And so if you have, uh, like in Billy's uh, picture there, the, the elevation change from A to B is the same, but if you reduce the stream length by 500 meters, then that water is gonna be energized and it's go, gonna go a lot faster. <clears throat> and we don't have many species, river species that really evolve to, to live in that sort of situation. And so the stream straightening is degrading in and of itself, you know, to the, in these native species, but then it makes it difficult for these streams to process nutrients. And so when they're a ditch, they're, you know, that's just basically an open air pipe. And so there's no opportunity for nutrients to get processed in a, in a ditch stream. And so um, the process of ditching the rivers, I think, is most harmful. Now, we have created ditches in the Des Moines Lobe, especially to move the water off. And, you know, believe it or not, we know some of those ditches on the Lobe are important habitat um, for a lot of the mineral species uh, that are native to that uh, landform. And so, these constructed ditches are not so much an issue in my estimation as, 
as much as that we've just ditched our rivers, um, especially in Western Iowa. Yeah, I thought I read somewhere that the Boyer was one of the most hydrologically altered streams almost anywhere. I mean, it's totally straightened from Wall Lake right down to Council Bluffs. Uh, there's no meanders in it anywhere. All right, with that, I think we've reached four o'clock. No more questions right now. So Chris, thank you so much for um, participating today in this important presentation. Um, I think it's important for us to continue to look at these water quality indexes. So thanks for the work and the presentation today. All right, you're welcome.